Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Crow, concertmaster of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Just in from outside, banging my pots in support of our healthcare workers, I'd like to welcome you to our first ever TSO watch party. We're excited to have you here online with us this evening when many of you would have been joining us at Roy Thompson Hall for an evening of Mahler and Brook. I'm gonna be joined by a few friends in this pre-watch party chat for a little bit of talking and also a musical surprise. But first, I wanted to let you know that before we broadcast the recording of Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde, we will be answering some of your burning questions. So if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, you can feel free to type them in the comment section and we'll get to some of them later. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to welcome our first guest to join us. You might recognize him from his 14 years on the podium at Roy Thompson Hall, and he was scheduled to be with us on stage tonight, but now he's going to be joining us from Connecticut. Welcome, Peter Ungin. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Peter, welcome back to Virtual Toronto. We've missed you here the last couple of years. Um, why don't you tell us what you've been up to since stepping down as music director of the TSO? Well, I've spent quite a bit of the time missing all of you as well, I have to say. Um, but I've been touring around, guest conducting in all kinds of different places. And um, also very involved at Yale University where we have numbers of fantastic students. And uh, I just love conducting those young players. Uh, and I'm also running a festival now in Boulder, Colorado. So I'm, I'm keeping myself very, very busy, but I'm also enjoying uh, a little bit less pressure of worrying about uh, all the details of running an orchestra. Uh, it doesn't sound like you have so much free time, but I, I got to say my students that go to Yale just love working with you um, and Mahler 5 and that sort of great repertoire that they get to play. Um, we were supposed to perform Mahler's Fifth Symphony this week. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces and a work that I got to play with you twice in the past nine years. Why did you choose this repertoire for your big return to Toronto? Well, I mean, Mahler, of course, for, for conductors and, and for all of us uh, as players is one of the great pinnacles of the repertoire. No matter which symphony you're doing, it's just so fascinating. There's so much going on. There's so much drama. There's so much really deep passion and feeling and often sadness in the music. And so it, I think it stimulates us very much. And just coming back after not seeing all of you for two years, I, I really wanted to relate as closely as possible uh, to everyone. And there's so many wonderful solos in Mahler 5, obviously for trumpet and horn and um, all kinds of instruments. But also the journey itself is so powerful because it starts in such a somber uh, character with his funeral marches full of, of dread and sadness. And, and then, you know, after an hour and 10 minutes, you reach uh, a level of joy, which is hard to describe. And it, it just only Mahler can take us on that kind of journey. So I thought it was an appropriate kind of piece to come back with. Well, you know, it's, it's a piece I got to do twice with you. And it was also the very first piece I ever played with you when I joined the orchestra nine years ago. Um, somebody else who joined the orchestra nine years ago, one of our great soloists in the TSO is Heidi Bearcroft, our principal harp, who's going to be joining us right now. Welcome, Heidi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. You're um, Heidi, you and I first met and were hired together almost exactly nine years ago during a week that was almost exactly the same as this planned show. Nine years ago was Mahler's Fifth Symphony and Brooke's Scottish Fantasy with Josh Bell. Um, this would have been Mahler's Fifth and Brooke Violin Concerto. But going back to nine years ago, the Mahler Five and Brooke's Scottish Fantasy, both pieces with massive heart parts, this was a trial week for both of us with the orchestra. And you told me before that you'd been doing an entire year of auditioning with the TSO. Tell us a little bit what it was like to prepare for that week, what it was like to play that week with the symphony, and, and then what it was like to hear that you'd gotten the job. Well, just to clarify, I wasn't doing an entire year of auditioning, but the process spanned the entire year. So I first did a guest week, I think it was in October of uh, 2010. And that was with Peter conducting, I think it was Janacek Taras Bulba, I'll never forget. It was, it was so thrilling to get to work with um, the Toronto Symphony. And actually, I had met Peter way, way back. I must have been 10 or 11 years old. He was guest conducting the Pittsburgh Symphony, where my mother is currently principal harp and my father co-principal oboe for 41 years. So I remember um, meeting him backstage and obviously being starstruck. So, you know, the fates aligned and I was so fortunate to be hired by Peter. And you're right, it was Mahler 5 and Scottish Fantasy, two of the biggest 
harp parts. So thank you, Peter, for programming it that way. It, no was, problem. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was really fortuitous for me and a really thrilling experience to play such exposed repertoire. In fact, the brook has the harp featured up front, uh, very close to the violin soloist. So it was really exciting, um, you know, foray into the, the Roy Thompson Hall atmosphere and the amazing camaraderie in, in the Toronto Symphony. It was a perfect way, actually, to really hear you. And I already knew what a wonderful artist you were and, and wonderful musician and harpist. So uh, it was just wonderful to have a program like that. And it was not a difficult hire. Thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> Peter, during your time in Toronto, you hired almost 40 new players, I think, including Heidi and myself. That's almost half the orchestra. Is that a lot of pressure? I mean, you got to get the right people and you got to get the right fit. What goes through your mind when you're going through this whole process? Yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing. I probably have done over 200 auditions by this time in my life, and it's um, I mean, you, one basically gets down to the to this this point that when you have an opening in the orchestra, we always say it's an opportunity to make the orchestra even better. If we think of it that way, then we just try never to compromise, and we try to figure out who's really going to match this the style and the sound of the orchestra and complement us and even inspire us and pull even more out of us and um so jonathan i think all of the things i just said is something you do day after day and it's been such a joy to work with you all these years well the same for me you know when i got that phone call after not having seen you perhaps since ravinia when i was i think we just chatted about this 18 years old um and the chance to work with you as a conductor for so many years has been amazing um, and this repertoire too, I mean, this Mahler, Mahler 5 is a really important piece for me. It's something I played a lot as a student and a chance to play twice with you and unfortunately not this third time. Heidi, tell us a little bit about how you feel about Mahler and about the heart parts in Mahler. What does this bring for you? Uh, Mahler is one of my very favorite composers and that's always a tricky question as a musician. How do you narrow down your favorite works, your favorite composers? And um, Mahler to me just has a little bit of something for everyone. There's drama, there's sadness, there's moments of joy, there's there's just uh, such a huge uh, breadth of emotion that he is able to convey. And specifically for the harp, his writing, depending on the symphony, is very juicy. Um, so I'm very involved. And in fact, this fifth symphony features the harp quite prominently in the fourth movement, the adagietto. Um, it's the, this is a huge orchestrated work, meaning there's a lot of players on the stage, but for the fourth movement, the um, orchestra, orchestration drops down to just harp and uh, strings alone. And for the Das Lied that you'll be hearing later, there's actually two harps featured in the orchestra. So it's a really thrilling um, collaboration, both chamber music wise, and just getting a chance to show off what the harp can do in the context of an orchestra. Well, sounds beautiful. And speaking of collaborations, Peter, Heidi and I are so grateful to you for, well, hiring us, but bringing us to Toronto, but also for spending 14 years as director of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and really giving us so much joy getting to work with you. This is a little video that we put together as a thank you and as a present. We're sad that we can't play it for you tonight, but here's a little Mahler's Adagietto. Oh.
Wow. That's, you want me to speak now? <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. This, I don't have to say anything about why we're so lucky to have both of you in Toronto. And you just, from that, you, you hear the soul and the spirit and the beauty of the, of the music that comes out of you night after night. And, and you know what else occurred to me after you played, after I controlled my tears, <laughs> was that's probably exactly what Marla heard in his mind. The theme, the song, it, after all, it is a song. And, and then as with everything, he'll hear it on the piano or he'll hear it in his head and then he'll orchestrate it and make it something bigger and maybe in, in some ways more extraordinary. But there was something incredibly extraordinary about hearing just the two of you play that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Heidi, for arranging it. Did you take that from the orchestration, Heidi, or did you take it down from a piano part? I looked at the both the piano reduction and the score, yeah. and uh, it was a, a fun project trying to uh, pare it down just for the two of us. But I, I really hope that we can play the complete version, especially in person someday, because it was really special. And I had tears in my eyes too, because it's just such soulful music, like Peter said. Yeah. Unbelievable. Okay, we have a few questions from those of you on Facebook and YouTube. Let's see if anything comes up. Um, if not, I have a few questions for Peter. Um, Peter, I wanted to ask you about your summer festival. I was very sad to see today that it won't be happening, but not a surprise. And can you give us a little bit of a scoop on what some of the digital activities you're going to do might be? Yeah, I mean, we had this lovely festival. As, as with so many people, we had enormous celebration of, of Beethoven. We had Jan Leschetsky was going to come and hmm. play all the Beethoven piano concerti in one week. And uh, in addition to that, I was going to do Opus 131, which I'm not sure I ever did with you, Jonathan. No, we didn't do it. it before you you joined, but I have this arrangement for strings of the this incredible string quartet of Beethoven. Anyway, so all of it we have to leave aside, but Jan is going to do a virtual concert from his home. Also, Augustin Haderlich, that wonderful violin we all love, is going to do something. He might actually come down to my home because he's quite nearby in Connecticut. And if he's allowed to in uh, in a few weeks, uh, he'll come down and, and do um, a concert for us. Um, also, our own players from the orchestra are going to do some chamber music, uh, a little bit the, the sort of thing that you just did by, I mean, it's an incredible thing. I've, of course, never taken part in this, but zooming in somebody else's sound and then playing with it um, is very possible, as it turns out. And, of course, I'm sure everybody listening and watching uh, saw the Copeland, which was phenomenal. Uh, that Jeff Beecher put together, and all of you were gr great in that. So we'll be, there'll be things like that. And then the Takash Quartet is actually going to do the opening night. Uh, they live in Boulder, and they have a brand new violist, Richard O'Neill. So they're going to do our opening night, and I might actually be there in Chautauqua in the beautiful auditorium there. And then last thing to mention, the Juilliard Quartet, because it's Robert Mann's 100th anniversary. Uh, the original first violinist, the founding first violinist of the Juilliard Quartet. So we're going to have them play a concert to celebrate what would have been his 100th birthday. And we'd started a chain music series this year called the Robert Mann Chain Music Series to celebrate his life. So that and um, several other ideas, but uh, it's, I, you know, it's not quite like doing the actual festival, obviously, but we're trying to make it stimulating uh, for people because uh, I think we all know that being isolated like this, we're really hungry to hear things and, you know, again, thank you for that beautiful playing. Thank you, Peter. And there's a question from Melissa, will that duet be available to listen to over and over? Um, we're hoping so. And actually Heidi and I are hoping to record the entire movement at some point. So we'll see if we can get to make that happen. It was a lot of fun. Um, how about one more question, uh, Peter, do you see this one on your screen? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, to conduct Mahler, and actually, I actually have to say, especially does leave on the Erde, you just have to know so much about what's going on at all moments. You have to have 10 brains. Um, and then quite apart from all the thinking that's, that's happening, you have to be in the moment, in the music completely so that you free up the players uh, to express themselves. Because that's in the end, the most important thing that a conductor can do is enable the musicians in front of them to, to be at their best, to feel their freest, to express themselves. Um, and have, have the clarity when they need it so that they know to be together. But they don't need that all the time by any means. So uh, conducting Mahler is absolutely the most fascinating thing imaginable. The Adagietto is um, staggering to conduct. Um, but 
but especially when you've got a string sound like that and a harpist like that. Um, it, it, it sometimes, it's, you know, last thing to say about conducting generally, it's, it is, you give things and then you take things back. Um, you know, some of the time you're just letting it happen. And that's very important because that also is liberating. So if you're too controlling as a conductor, I, th I have a feeling that would be annoying. I mean, I've never really played in an orchestra for a long time, but um, but it's, uh, uh, I think that feeling of, of liberating, of saying, yeah, now here you need me and here go, just fly. So, and that happens very, very often in Mahler. It's interesting. That's kind of similar to what we're doing these days when we do recordings along with click tracks or with pre-recorded material. It's it's fun and it's lovely, but you're right. Sometimes you're like, there's you don't have the freedom. You don't feel like you can interact in quite the same way. So we're looking forward to being able to do that in a normal fashion, I think. Okay, almost time for a little bit of music. Um, so Peter, why don't you introduce what we're going to see tonight and tell us what our watch party viewers should be keeping an ear out for in Mahler's Das Lied van der Erde. Yeah, well, this is one of the greatest masterpieces ever written. And it took place in 2017 at the beginning of our season, 1718 season, which was my final season. And at that point, we were recording uh, for video a lot of things because of the Sesqui uh, celebrations, which was a, a wonderful thing. So we have actually quite a lot of, of, of videos of the orchestra from that season. Um, das Lied is phenomenal. It has two soloists in it. Uh, we had two extraordinary Canadian singers. Susan Platts and Michael Schader that night. Uh, and it was written in 1908, a very, very painful time in Mahler's life. I mean, Mahler, there was an extremely dark side to, to him in any case, but by 1908, he had just found out that he had a congenital heart defect, which would shorten his life significantly. Uh, his daughter, Maria, his oldest daughter, had just passed away from scarlet fever. Uh, he'd basically been ostracized from the Vienna Opera and had left. Uh, so his life was in a very dark place at that point. And in addition to that, he'd written eight symphonies and had this symphonic idea in his mind, but didn't want to call it his ninth symphony because he was fatalistic and he didn't want to have the same pattern as Beethoven, Schubert and Bruckner who preceded him and never gone beyond their ninth symphonies. So he decided to call this six song cycle uh, Das Lied von der Erde. Uh, and it is something absolutely extraordinary. I mean, he was obsessed always by the dichotomy between sorrow and joy, dread and longing and discontent and aspiration. And it's that constant agony about the duality of life's experience, I think, that stimulates so much of his music, and this is no exception. So there are six songs. Uh, song one, three, and five feature the tenor, two, four, and six, the alto. They never sing together. Um, and as contrasting as these songs feel, they're linked by various expressions of all these contradictions I was referring to earlier. Um, the texts are taken from old Chinese poems, and each one reflects in, in a different way this very struggle between joy and sorrow. Even the brief third uh, song, which is only three minutes long and seems apparently very joyful, von der Jugend, uh, from youth, it describes a pavilion in a pond, in a very still pond, and uh, it's made out of green and white porcelain. And there are these young people together, very elegant, conversing, having a wonderful time, drinking. It's all, everything is so peaceful and lovely. And then at the end of the song, he suddenly notices that in the reflection of the pond, which is completely still, you see the whole thing upside down. And it's a symbol of negation, even in that context. But it's the final song, the, the Abschied, the farewell, which lasts almost half an hour where he makes uh, his most enlightened statement, I would say. Uh, the beginning of the poem is, the sun sinks beneath the mountains, evening descends in all the valleys with its shadows that are full of coolness. And uh, I find this music both ominous, but at the same time, petrifyingly beautiful, both of those things. But ultimately, it does not signify an abandonment of hope but rather a vision of eternity, a vision of peace and calm, as the alto repeats the word ewig, forever. And Mahler leaves us not with a resolution, but instead floating in an eternal paradise. That's briefly how I feel about, about Das Lied von der Erde. It's, um, I could go on for obviously 
hours about it and I wouldn't get bored, you probably would. But uh, I just, the other, one other thing to, to point out about this is a huge orchestra, but very rarely plays together. There's a tremendous amount of chamber music, just a few players at one time. And I just wanted to say, listen to Kelly Zimba, the flute player. It, first week almost, maybe second week in the orchestra, listen to that incredible solo playing. Listen to Sarah Jeffers, Sarah Jeffries longing in her oboe playing. Joaquin, of course, Michael Sweeney, Neil Deland and the whole horn section sounds so fantastic. Andrew McCandless, um, and of course the two of you, uh, and naturally Susan and Michael, just um, incredibly wonderful playing. And it's one of my fondest memories of my many, many happy years uh, with the Toronto Symphony. So thank you. I, I hope everybody will enjoy this performance. Well, I remember well playing it back in 2017. I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Uh, thanks Peter and Heidi for joining us today. We're looking forward to welcoming Peter back twice next season, along with two performances of Mahler with Peter's successor, Gustavo Jimeno. Thank you to Joyce Goodman, Alan Kimberly, and Pam Spackman, who had originally supported the performances this week with Peter. And if you're, head, if you're watching on our website, stay put. But if you're on YouTube or Facebook, head over to tso.ca slash watch party, where the broadcast will start shortly. Now is your last chance to grab your drink, popcorn, sit back and relax while you enjoy Gustav Mahler's Das Lied van der Erde, featuring your Toronto Symphony Orchestra, conducted by conductor emeritus Peter Ungin and with soloists mezzo-sopreno Susan Platz and tenor Michael Schade. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the concert. 